Hello there, my name is Michael Fudge. Let's take a few minutes to learn Docker. So what is Docker? Docker is a technology which simplifies the complexity of delivering software applications. So how does Docker do this? Your application and all its dependencies are bundled into an image. And basically, if you have any particular application, like let's suppose you're running a, a, a website, all the software necessary to run that website would be contained into that single image. So the container represents that image when it runs. Containers are isolated from each other and from your host computer. So this avoids the, the software conflict problem. So here are the basic advantages that you get from the containerization that Docker affords. One, there's no need to install anything on your computer other than Docker itself. The containers that run are isolated from each other, which avoids conflicts. And they're also isolated from the host computer with the software already installed on your host computer. And most importantly, what Docker gives us is reproducibility. If it runs on my machine, it's going to run on your machine. It's going to run in your data center. It's going to run anywhere. As long as the architecture match matches, you won't have any problems running the image. So let's kind of walk through a basic workflow with Docker to sort of give you a better idea how this all comes together. So someplace you have these images stored. Now you can build your own images as well, but that's sort of beyond the scope of what we're going to do today. We'll get an image off of Docker Hub, and then we want to put it on our computer that's running Docker. And we issue a command called Docker Pull, and Docker Pull will download the image off of Docker Hub and then put it on our computer. Now we want to run that image on our computer so that the application is now executing. Right now the application is at rest and we would like to execute it. So we, we type in a docker run command and the docker run command then runs that image in a container. And I can run another docker run command and run another instance of that image in a, in a second container. Likewise, I could also pull down another image and run that. One thing you have to do to get started is install Docker. If you have a Mac or Windows, you're going to install the Docker desktop. If you have um, Linux, you're just going to install one of the Docker server platforms down here. But basically, that's going to be in the notes, and um, that's not going to be part of the video of setting up Docker. So I'm out here at my command prompt, and I have Docker installed. You can see when I run Docker, it has a lot of different options. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by kind of walk you through the process of, of getting going with Docker here by grabbing a popular image out here. I'm on the Docker Hub, and I'm going to put in Jupyter. It's going to bring up the Jupyter Data Science Notebook, Pro pretty popular application and fairly non-trivial to get this to run normally outside of Docker. You'd have to install a lot of things to get this to work. So this is a classic example of something you may want to run in a container. So over here, it has the docker pull command. I'm going to execute that command out here at the command line. And it downloads the image. Now, I pre-downloaded it before the video. Normally, it would take a lot longer to do this. Now that I have the image downloaded, I can view all the different images that are installed on my computer by doing a docker images. So when I type in Docker images, you can see a list of the images that I've downloaded. And here is the one that I pulled earlier, this Jupyter Data Science Notebook. You also see there's a bunch of other ones that I pulled part of what I do every day. Let me demonstrate how to pull something else down with a specific version. So I can pull something down by its tag. You look over here, the tag say latest. That just grabs the latest version, but you can also pull a very specific version of any image. So I'm going to do a Docker pull nginx, and I'm going to pull version 113.7. And that's going to go down and pull this image. Now if I do a Docker images, there's the Nginx image as well. And you see it pulled that particular version. So that's what the tagging does. The tagging allows us to grab a very specific version of the image. All right, let's run a container from that data science notebook image. What happens is I get back the ID of the running container. If I do a Docker PS. I can see what's running, and you can see there's my container ID again. Matches that. And there's the image I'm running. This is what's uh, needed network-wise by that image. The container is not allowing that, so I can't get to this. And then over here is the name of the container that's running, and this name is auto-generated. And this is not really a good way to run an image because um, generally when I like to run my images, I like to name them so I can refer to them. Maybe I want to look at the logs. I could say Docker logs. I have to say the name of the image, which is Friendly Bartik. So this is the running logs from this particular container right here. You can see that it has some information about how I can actually um, connect to the application through a web browser right here. This is not going to work because if I show you again, 
when I ran the image as a container, I didn't expose this port externally. So there's no way for my computer to connect to the application that's running inside the container. This container is completely walled off. All right, let's go through the motions of stopping and then removing this container. Then we'll create this container in a way that makes it a little more accessible. Stop it. So if I Docker PS, it's not running anymore. But if I docker ps dash a, it will show me all the containers, even the ones that have stopped. That's what dash a does. And you can see that it's here and it says exited, which means the container has stopped. So let me remove it. Now it's gone. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this container like this. I'm going to do a docker run. The dash d again is necessary to run it in the background. And then this dash p, what this says is inside the image, it, it's running on port 8888, and I would like to expose that outside the image at, on port 8888. So these don't always have to match, but this one here that I have highlighted, that one ends up being the publicly accessible TCP port. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to name my container so that I can refer to it a lot easier than generate a name like Friendly Bartik. I'm gonna have uh, Jupiter one as my name, and then there's my image. So I'm gonna do that, run that. If I do Docker PS, I now see it's running, and instead of just seeing ports 8888 TCP, now I see that it's been exposed anywhere on the internet. If I go to this host and ask for port 8888, I'm going to see the application running. And then the container name is Jupyter1. So let's go take a look at those logs again. And there's my URL. Now I'm going to copy this URL. Let's open up a browser and paste it. And then I get my application. Pretty cool. So in here, I can, you know, start using my application any way I would, right? I'm going to just write some Python here, run some Python. Awesome. Okay, so my application works. And again, I didn't have to install anything to make this application go. All I had to do was grab the image and then run the image. The only real caveat in there is I had to make sure to expose the service that was running inside the container outside the container and I just chose to use the same ports. What you might notice next, let's let's go through the scenario a little further. So I'm here and I made this file. Awesome, right? Now what happens when I shut down the container? So let's do this. Let's say docker stop Jupyter1. Now I can start the container back up. And then I can go back to this page and reload it and everything's still there because I stopped the container. I never removed the container. However, if I stop the container and then I go back here just to show you, container is stopped. See, it's taking forever and then I get this, can't find it. Service is no longer running. Then if I go back to command line and say docker rm and I remove that container, the next time I start the container, I can't start it now, by the way, because it doesn't exist. There's no container to start. So I have to rerun it again and recreate the container. Because I did this, I cannot reload this page, first of all, because it doesn't know the, the token. The token will have changed. And this is just a, a feature of the way the application works in this case. But more importantly, if I take this URL and copy it, and then again, go back to the website to run my application, I lost my file. It's gone. And that's because the way that the containers are designed is they are temporary. The data in the image that survives, okay, that's like static, but whatever you do while you're running the container is ephemeral. And then once you remove the container itself, you have now lost all the data. So you, you need to figure out a way around this. And, and the way to circumvent this is to use a volume. Basically what is going on here, let me, let me stop this again. Let's go find that stop and let's remove it. All right, and just make sure it's not running. And it's certainly not there anymore, okay? What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to start this container. I'm gonna run it again, but this time I'm gonna pass in a volume and the name of this volume, I'm just gonna call it uh, Jupyter Data and it's going to map to home, J-O-V-Y-A-N. Just talk about a couple things here really quickly. This port map says this is the internal port in the container that the, that the application requires. And this is how I'm going to expose it externally. With the volume map, it does the same thing. Internally, this is the folder where my stuff gets stored. When I was on this website here, 
where is this particular folder located physically within the image? It's located here. How did I know that? I had to read some information about how the image was built. Usually this information can be found on Docker Hub. What's on this side is the name of the volume. This is the thing that's going to persist be between me bringing the image up and down from a container. So if when I, when I run this, it's going to make this volume, Jupyter Data. When I do a stop in RM, this Jupyter Data volume is still going to be there. And as long as I continue to mount it, my files will remain. So let me demonstrate that now. This is an important concept. So I'm going to run this, do your Docker logs here, so I can get the application's URL again, because it's different every time, unfortunately. OK, I'm going to go here. Now we're logged in. Now let's make a file. You know, I'm a file. Good. Let's leave it. Okay, there it is. Now I'm going to tear it all down. All right, so I'm going to do my Docker stop and my Docker RM. And now let's just show you. Not there. But if I do a Docker volume ls, you'll see that there's a volume there called Jupyter Data that I made. Right up here it says Jupyter Data. So this volume exists somewhere in my host and it is going to permanently save any of the data that I then write while I use the application into this folder. Let's see this in action. I'm going to rerun my image and putting it into a container called Jupyter One again and remap my ports and my volumes. And then again I got to do my Docker logs again because I'm sure that ID has changed and it has. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to paste it up here. First of all, let me reload this just to show you. See, I reload this. Oh, it 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 um it already it already knew that because it's the same ID. But if I just do that again, there it is, untitled. Right? It is there. It is it is persistent. Now, just so you don't think I'm pulling the wool over your eyes, if I go back here really quickly, and let me just remove. Let me just stop the container and remove the container, and let me run it again without the volume map. All right, and we'll go back and maybe we'll get lucky. Okay, it's asking me for the token this time, so I need to go back here and get it. Docker logs, right, which is right there because it expired. Copy that. And again, the, the reason I'm copying this URL every time is it's a, this is a function of the Jupyter application. This is not does not have anything to do with Docker. And you'll see that my file is now missing. And that's because, again, I didn't mount that volume which has my data in it really nice. This is kind of neat. I like containers and stuff, but what I don't like is having to type all these long commands like this or type, you know, every time I need to get rid of it, I need to stop it and remove it, right? So yeah, there's a, a solution to that and it's it's called Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a means to take several containers and get them to come up and down together and also have them talk to each other if you need to. It's also pretty useful when you just have one container, but you have a lot of settings and configuration in it, because what you can do is you can make a Docker Compose file. In this Docker Compose file, you can configure everything you need to run the container. So if you look in here, some of the things you see in here, image, right? Image was there somewhere in my Docker run. Let's go back to my Docker run here. Let's see if I can get this to look side by side a bit move this down and then move that over there. That's perfect. So I have Docker run and then um, these are my ports and you can see in my Docker compose file there's my ports. Oh, this one does not have the volumes in it. This one has the volumes and then uh, there's my volumes and uh, this is how I prefer to do my volumes here. This time I'm just going to use a folder. I'm going to say take the current directory and then take a folder off that current directory and put my files there. That way I can access the files outside the container relatively easily because it's just in a folder and not in a Docker volume. And then here's the image name. And then you can see the image name right, right here. So the Docker compose file translates to the same Docker run command that you would type. That's one thing. Second thing is that it's a little easier to manage because you can just use some really simple commands. So for, for instance, if I want to start this container. I say Docker compose up dash D 
to run it in the background. Oh, it's already running, right? I never stopped it. So I need to do my Docker stop. See, it's saying I cannot use 0008888 because it's already used, right? So I, I forgot to stop and remove. I guess I don't have to remove it, but I will remove it. And now I can do my Docker compose up. It brings it up and I can do a Docker compose PS and I get a nice view of what's running. So I have this, this is the name of it. It automatically generates a name in the Docker compose file from the name of the service, which was Jupyter. And the folder you're in, the folder that I'm in is called Let's Learn Docker. So the service is Let's Learn Docker underscore Jupyter underscore one because it's the first one. That's what it does. And then here's the uh, port exposure. And currently it's up and running. And I could do a Docker compose logs to see the logs a little easier. I don't have to specify the container name. And I can do um, Docker compose down if I want to bring it down. And when you bring it down, it turns off the container and removes the container and also removes anything else associated with the container. So this is a really easy and convenient way to deploy an application that has a lot of dependencies is, is to use Docker Compose file instead. Well, that's the basics of Docker. I really appreciate you watching. Thanks and have a good day. Bye now.